welcome to Eyes on Enterprise, where I'll be bringing on Googlers to talk about how the technology landscapes are changing how enterprises adapt, modernize, and scale. My name is Stephanie Wong, Developer Advocate, and today I have Yu Feng Guo, Developer Advocate for Machine Learning on the show. Welcome to the show. Thanks so much, Stephanie. I'm really excited to be here and chat about machine learning. So first off, just thinking about some examples of it, do you have any that you've encountered of specific ML use cases that have come in and kind of swept in a company off its feet a little bit? Well, the you know first kind of big examples around these came from kind of image recognition type use cases. So you know, on the one hand, you have common examples uh, like Google Photos, you know, really changing how we think about uh, storing and searching for pictures and other kinds of recognition tasks where. You can auto tag images, um, and then of course medicine is now seeing a rapid shift in um, diagnosis in radiology, where uh, they're applying this technology to find things more accurately, more quickly, and more consistently than you know doctors can because machines don't fatigue and they're always uh, you know consistently they're they're not going to be upset because they were late for work and stuck in traffic earlier that morning. Yeah. And one thing I was thinking about earlier was machine learning versus AI. I think there's a lot of confusion there about which term is technically accurate. So what's your opinion on that? Classically or traditionally, AI was referring to the broad field of just general you know, artificial intelligence, AI. And it was about systems that were artificial intelligence. And anything really could apply to that. Back in um, you know, decades ago in the 80s, a lot of these were rule-based systems. So they were things that behaved like an intelligence you know, would, at least how back then folks thought about it. But they were just rule-based systems, if statements and things like that. If this happens, then we'll do this. And not terribly um, complex, right? But there were lots of different approaches to doing AI. So AI is kind of the broad umbrella. Gotcha. Machine learning then becomes one set of tools to try to achieve AI. And it's possible that we'll ultimately kind of achieve or, or do better in AI with some other set of tools that isn't even machine learning or maybe evolves from machine learning. And so machine learning is really about um, some mixture of statistical inference and kind of training on uh, some set of data and creating a model and doing these uh, predictions. Yeah, that's great. I think they're used a lot of the times interchangeably, but mm -hmm. it's great clarification <laughs> to have because they really are quite different in yeah. what they encompass. Absolutely. All right, so let's talk about a typical use case for an enterprise. For a company that's just looking to get started, dip their toes into machine learning for the first time, what would you describe as the workflow for them to get started? Yeah. So. You know, assuming that they have some kind of system they're trying to model, some kind of task they have in mind, the first consideration then becomes checking to make sure they have the data, and if not, collecting that data. And so, for example, if they want to um, figure out consumer preferences, say they're a retail store, and so they'll collect that data uh, around kind of purchasing patterns and things like that. And many retailers these days probably have that data already. It's sitting around somewhere. They got to figure out how to get their hands on it because it might be siloed off uh, in different parts of the organization and their people might be holding on closely to that. And so getting access to that in a way where you can aggregate data together is important. And then once you have that data, you can do analysis on it. So that becomes kind of the next piece. Looking at what data do you have? Is it useful? Are there signals in it? And from there, you can do kind of the traditional machine learning training piece of it, where you take that data, train up a model, and then deploy it to make predictions. But we're not quite done yet. Um, just because you've created a model and put it in production doesn't mean that you can now you know, forget about it and just let it sit there, just as you wouldn't um, leave production code out on your website or a system and just say, I'm done. We, we don't need software developers anymore. This, <laughs> this software is done. It's just going to sit there. That's not going to work. And so models need to be updated over time as well. As purchasing patterns change with the seasons, with the years, that information should feed back and inform updated models. Right, so constant evaluation of model, and then as things change, you need to incorporate that into training. Exactly. So it's kind of in a lot of ways just like software development. You need to maintain your model over time. So I want to dive into that a little bit more because I know that you had a video that was very popular a couple of years ago that were, was on the seven steps to machine learning, and that included gathering your data, data preparation, choosing a model, 
training, evaluation, and hyperparameter tuning, and then prediction as well. So can you tell me about each of the steps a little bit in detail? Who do you hire for each of those? And um, what are the trade-offs? A little bit more about that? Sure. So with kind of these seven steps, so to speak, you know, there's no real you know, seven steps, six steps, 10 steps. You can break it out however you'd like. Um, it was just really one way to delineate it. And a lot of times different steps can be collapsed into one you know, job role. It could be one week's worth of work where like you gather data and you kind of do that data preparation, cleaning and things like that. That might go together. You might end up making a pipeline. Whereas new data comes in and you know how you would like to transform it, you can set up a ongoing streaming job where that data coming in gets transformed and then deposited in some kind of data warehouse. Then looking onwards to things like training and model development, as well as, as you alluded to, hyperparameter tuning, this is really the, the meat of it where a lot of people spend a lot of their kind of um, mental energy thinking about modeling. In a lot of ways, especially for known use cases and kind of solved problems that aren't research um, bleeding edge situations, you can use a lot of existing state-of-the-art models and adapt them for your particular data set, customize it, and get really uh, pretty much state-of-the-art results for your data set. So I want to go back to a point that you mentioned earlier about model evaluation. Can you talk about why it's so important for an organization to consistently evaluate their model? Are there any use cases that showcase that it's so crucial or failures that you've seen? Yeah, so so we can take kind of a toy example and work through it, right? The you know the data that you are um, predicting on needs to come from the same world, so to speak, that you've trained the model on. So this, uh, in statistical terms, means like your training, evaluation, test set, all this data needs to come from the same distribution, essentially. And furthermore, that distribution also needs to reflect the reality of the world. Right, so there's two pieces to it. For example, if let's say we go and we train a model that can recognize uh, pictures of um, lawn furniture, so chairs, and you can go and you know you go in the studio and you take your your uh, you know your chair company, you make lots of different kinds of chairs. So you're going to make a model, then you maybe you make an app and people can hold up to their camera to the chair and be like, ah, oh, yes, it's this kind of chair. Now I can go buy one for my lawn as well or something like that. <laughs> yeah. And so you bring in, you know, you set up a big studio and you bring in all of your latest, hottest chairs, you know, for the next season and you put it on nice backdrops with good lighting and you take a bunch of pictures and videos and you do a whole shoot. And you take that uh, content, all those images, and you train a, a machine learning model that can recognize these images. This is great if your task that you're trying to make uh, is a model that can recognize pictures of your products in, say, your catalog. Right, because those are the same pictures, basically, and they'll be in the same situations and lighting and all that. But it doesn't really help our actual use case where they are going to be in um, your customers' homes uh, with a backdrop of grass and other, you know, the patio and things like that. They'll be in the context of other things. So you've got to capture data in the same world that you're going to be predicting on. And furthermore, and this is kind of the ongoing evaluation piece. What happens when winter comes and that green grass turns white mm -hmm. and your model's never seen snow before? <laughs> and it's going to start having problems. And so um, this is why you need a diversity of training data in all sorts of scenarios that is representative of how you expect your model to be seeing these images during prediction time. So hence, constant evaluation. Yeah. And then just as important to collect data points of labels that are the prediction that you're looking for, but also examples where it's not that. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So in this particular scenario, it would mean also having images of these environments with your chair removed. Right. So just a normal lawn, maybe there's some leaves on the lawn. So of course the question arises, what if the validation performance of the model is just isn't up to par. Yeah, I mean, poor model performance can come from all sorts of factors. You know, it includes things like the wrong modeling technique. Maybe you don't have enough data. Um, um, maybe you're overfitting on that data. Uh, there's there's lots of possible causes, and this is kind of where expertise and experience really become valuable. Is it's you know easy to follow the kind of golden path of just do this and do this and do this and it'll work. But then when something goes wrong, fixing problems. That's where um, you know, 
expertise comes through. Yeah, and overfitting, what do you, can you just describe yeah. what that is? So overfitting is essentially uh, a way to describe the fact that the model has memorized the training data. This is bad because it is going to struggle then with real predictions because all it knows is the exact training data. So in the example with images, it's basically memorized these pictures and said, you know, I will only classify this as a lawn chair if I see this exact image mm. or these 10 exact images. So let's say I, I have my problem. I've collected the data, prepared it. What do I do to set it up? And what tooling exists out there? What's the general developer experience for machine learning? Yeah, so for developing your own model, there's a lot of libraries out there today. Um, things like TensorFlow being a prominent one in the industry that's really seen a lot of adoption. Um, of course, there's things like Scikit-Learn, which is, as I mentioned earlier, it's kind of a machine learning, but not technically deep learning. It's deep learning adjacent, but also machine learning tech toolkit. And of course, there's also things like Keras and PyTorch and other deep learning tools that can also be employed to you know, model a, a given data set. And then in terms of a language like R, which is more targeted toward statisticians who have a lot more experience with that sort of thing, uh, you can also use it for structured data. Sometimes language models will show up there. But by and large, the industry has seen this real uh, shift to using Python as the language of choice around doing machine learning. So I want to talk about this by problem type, because as you said, a lot of industries have their own styles of data sets, and they need to approach it in the right way. So can you talk about how you would do that? Yeah. So I think the first question you have to ask yourself when you, you know, want to do some kind of machine learning or data science task is, is it a descriptive problem? Is it a predictive problem? Or is it a prescriptive problem? So I know those are kind of long words, and they all kind of sound similar. So let's go into each of those a little bit. A descriptive problem is really kind of your traditional classic data analysis problem. A lot of times when people think they need a machine learning solution, really they are just asking, you know, given some data, um, can you help me find some patterns in it? I don't really know what I'm looking for. Can you just describe some interesting things? So dashboarding, putting up some nice visualizations, cleaning up the data so that you can do that. That is, in a lot of ways, a good first step to even doing other types, types of machine learning tasks. So that's descriptive. And then there's predictive, which is much of what we classically think of as machine learning. You, know, you have your training data. There's something you're trying to predict. right? And then um, you train a model and make these predictions. So that's something where you have inputs in the real world, and then you say, you know, I predict that this will you know, be a good outcome or not, things like that, or, or given a, a tweet, is it a positive tweet or a negative tweet, right. things like that. And then thirdly, we have the prescriptive task. And these are a little more uncommon at this point, um, because this is where you are saying, I want to build a system that will tell me what to do next. And so that has some element of almost like if we're playing a game of like chess or something, right? What is the next move I should make? And this system should be thinking about what is my my opponent playing and what kind of options you know you have mm. and kind of gaming it out. So it's a little bit of game theory in there right. and things like that. And so this is why it's a little harder to do in the real world because th such a system would need so many inputs. Right. Right? It can't just model the entire known universe and be like, ah, the perfect next move <laughs> if is only this. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. All right, so I want to talk a little bit about processing, because a lot of companies are looking towards the cloud to do training and production. Is this the only viable option to really do it at that scale, or is there an opportunity for hybrid approach? When you look at it from the perspective of your data set, if you have a huge data set, and you don't have any way of really storing it on-prem, and there's more data coming in all the time, there's only one answer, right? But in a lot of situations today, maybe you're only interested in doing machine learning on a certain slice of data, on a certain subset, and there it might make sense to do training locally and then deploy that to the cloud to, you know, alongside all of your other applications. There's a number of different ways to slice and dice the different workflows in the cloud, you know, but it basically boils down to self-service and managed services. And so a self-serve situation would be your classic make a VM, configure it yourself, put whatever you want on it, run your training, you know, maybe you put it in a Kubernetes cluster if you need more machines, things like that. And then on the other hand, you have managed services which are more along the lines of 
putting up a Python package or putting up your code and then having this managed service take care of the provisioning and setup of, and teardown of these machines after they finish running your job, running your training job and output that exported model file. In terms of thinking about which one to do, I think the big one that I've seen come up in terms of why would you want to serve a machine learning model locally? And that answer typically is along the lines of response time and latency. So sometimes you have a model that goes on a mobile device and it needs to work either more quickly or work in situations with no connectivity. And so then you would shrink that model down, put it on your phone. And, and embed it into your application. Uh, on the other side of things, you, why would you keep it on a local server in your own data center? Maybe you need to be close proximity. You need to be close to wherever you're communicating to. Um, typically, that shows up in um, kind of financial situations where you need to make kind of millisecond decisions, and these predictions are only good for the next slight window of time before, I mean, the markets change all yeah. the time. Yeah, so it makes me think of stock market and then on the mobile side, IoT use cases. Absolutely, yeah. So one thing I've been curious about was how long training needs to take and how many iterations does a team need to go through before achieving an optimal model that they can deploy in production? Yeah, this is kind of the, the quintessential question about machine learning. Um, you, know, you can train a small model on a moderate sized data set in seconds, low number of minutes, but if you have a big data set and you have really high you know, requirements of accuracy or performance, it might take weeks <laughs> even to train up a model. Like some of these huge research models that are really pushing the state of the art, um, they're literally training on hundreds of GPUs, pushing you know petaflops of power oh, wow. and doing this for weeks on end. That's wild. Yeah, and then at the end you have a model and it's like, oh, I hope that worked because yeah. I just burned all of this compute right. and time um, hoping to get something out of that. Uh, but yeah, it really comes down to what are you optimizing for? Do you, how much do you care about those accuracy metrics? You know, in a situation where maybe you're making uh, recommendations on a website, you know, you're shopping and it says, you know, hey, some other products that are similar to this product. You know, if one of them is a little bit off or we looks weird, it's yeah. not, the, not the end of the What's world. What's at stake here is the <laughs> yeah. real question. Yeah, exactly. Like, yeah. Um, but on the other hand, in situations like a self-driving car or a medical diagnosis, like. These are literal life and death decisions. And so having a model that is reliable, performance, and accurate is way, way more important, and the stakes right. are much higher. Um, the self-driving car use case is another one where latency matters. And so that's why you are not going to see cars signaling it back up to the cloud, be like, should I turn left or right here? <laughs> you might run into a wall at that point. Exactly. So what are our options at Google to move from dev to prod, and have it work reliably in production at that scale? One of the services we have is the Cloud AI Platform's prediction um, kind of service managed service. And all you really need to do is take your exported model, say, here it is, give it a name, and you're basically done. Um, it's, it's pretty magical in that sense because it's an auto-scaling service. So you don't have to worry about provisioning infrastructure, responding to um, spikes in demand, you know, maybe during the holidays, during weekends, things like that. And so it'll automatically scale up and then automatically scale back down when traffic dies off. And all you have to do is you know, finish training your model and kind of toss it over the wall in some ways. <laughs> um, you know, I know it's said a lot that you don't want to just toss the model over the wall from your data science team to kind of your productionization team. But if your model is being deployed in production by a service and you know, the data scientists can basically just do that themselves, it, it's like one command, yeah. then it kind of changes the game in terms of where you can spend your time. You can focus on getting good data, getting good training outputs, and then once that's done and you're ready to push it to production, it's not like this onerous task that you then have to you know, get another team to handle and coordinate with the modeling team and things like that. Yeah. So it's really I'm nice. seeing that as a commonality for you know cloud in general. Mm. We talked a little bit about managed services versus custom modeling, and I know we have varying options at Google as well. Can you dive into that? Yeah, I mean, it all comes down to your comfort with kind of building, running, and maintaining these systems yourself and the expertise you have in-house, as well as when you think about, you know, do you want this to be kind of an investment in the long term, or is it something where you want it to just kind of work and, and like have it be good enough? Uh, managed services, things like AutoML, and, and they're going to be uh, necessarily a little bit more constrained because you can't 
have them be fully customized. That's the nature, by definition, of this comparison. I think there's a key point here. For those who don't necessarily have the right skill sets, um, or they don't have the time, then that's a great option is to utilize machine learning APIs. And then even for those who have experience with TensorFlow, and I know TensorFlow 2 is, is out now, but we have libraries that people can leverage instead of reinventing the wheel in creating a model from the get-go. Exactly. Okay, so I want to talk about some of the amazing use cases because I know you've worked with many companies in the past. So industry use cases in medical field, IoT, that are really utilizing the advancements in machine learning and some of the Google tooling. Two that come to mind is one is the kind of advancements on the medical side, right? Diabetic retinopathy is kind of this leading cause of blindness and um, Google has made huge strides in improving the diagnosis of um, diabetic retinopathy, which is kind of helps prevent blindness um, uh, as a result, kind of side effect of diabetes. Um, and so that effort is kind of ongoing and, and the work they've done in the kind of publications, you know, for me, it was the first time I'd seen a computer science paper get published in the um, in JAMA, in the Journal of the American Medical Association, right. which is like, you know, when does computer science get to publish in the medical journal? Um, so that was really cool. On the other kind of use case, uh, I got to work a little bit with the Rainforest Connection, and they're a nonprofit that kind of helps prevent illegal logging in the Amazon. And they have these devices uh, called Guardians out in the forest, and they're listening. They're listening for the sound of trees being cut, cut down, right? Because they're wow. listening. So then they have all of this audio data coming in and they need to process that and they need to pick out from there and recognize, you know, oh, there's sound from that and then they can uh, notify law enforcement, right? And they can go out and prevent that stuff. That's really cool. Yeah. I love that. Yeah. yeah. So, and the other cool thing about it is now they're taking that data, they're saying, wow, I have all this data and they're realizing what else is in this data set? They're hearing sounds of animals, endangered species, yeah. and they can start using that information to find you know, movement patterns of animals throughout mm -hmm. the jungle, which is like just wild. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so we just covered a lot of surface area when it comes to machine learning. I mean, companies need to think about having enough for compute and storage, the data sets, the right personnel, and then constantly reevaluating their models as new data comes in. So how can you kind of digest all of this? Yeah, it's a real culture shift. Um, in terms of making a company and business uh, data aware and using kind of data in an intelligent fashion, it's not going to happen overnight. But I think you know, getting started sooner than later is really important, and you know it's going to take time. But it will really transform kind of how a business can you know really take advantage of the information that it already has. So, with all that being said, what can people do to get value out of ML right now? Yeah, I mean, it really depends on kind of where you're at in terms of your experience and what you already know. But you, you can kind of think about it in terms of, do you want to do kind of managed services and APIs where you can get started just understanding and digesting some of these high level concepts about machine learning and putting data in and seeing what comes out the other side, so to speak. Um, and if you already have some familiarity with that, then diving into the tools directly, whether you're using um, TensorFlow or Keras and just trying it out. There's tons of amazing materials out there today in terms of tutorials and guides and workshops and videos. Um, Another area, if you're looking to like just play around with ML, so to speak, from a conceptual level, uh, Google has a set of AI experiments, which are just a ton of fun. You can try them out in your browser. Also, you have your show, AI Adventures. So I'm encouraging everyone to check that series out because he's going to go a lot more in detail on some of these topics. Um, overall, Please uh, check out the blogs, the videos. We're going to have the links to what he just mentioned in the description below. I want to thank you so much for being on the show today, Yufeng. I learned a ton. Thanks so much, Stephanie. It's been a blast. And um, also, please comment on your thoughts on the show, what ML projects you're working on, the tools you're using, and your thoughts about what we discussed today. Thanks again for checking out Eyes on Enterprise. <laughs>